This morning we're going to continue our study in the book of Revelation. We're in Revelation chapter 7, and we're going to continue uh, studying about the 144,000. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you again for another opportunity to come together to study your holy word. We ask, as always, for the Holy Spirit to be with us to be our guide, to be our teacher, to lead us and guide us into all truth. I pray, dear Lord, that you will hide me behind the cross of Calvary. I pray that my life will be hidden in Christ and in God. In Jesus' blessed name, amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Revelation 7. Revelation 7, on last Sabbath, we looked at the first part of this, and we discovered that the first part, uh, the Lord had four angels on the four corners of the earth, and they were holding the winds of strife until the servants of God should be sealed in their foreheads. And so, and then John said he heard the number that were sealed, and they were 140 and 4,000 of, of the tribes of the children of Israel. And then he went on to enumerate the names of each tribe, and each tribe had 12,000 in it. And so we're gonna continue picking up at verse nine, which is very interesting, where it says, after this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude. So it starts off on last Sabbath, we looked at John heard the number that were sealed. But then he says, and after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, verse 9, which no man could number, of all the nations and kindreds and people and tongues that stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. The first group he sees is the 144,000. He says, these are the tribes of Israel. And then he sees a number that no man could number, but this group is comprised of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Now, there are debates within theological circles as to whether or not these are one in the same group. Some say yes, some say no. And guess what my answer is this morning? It doesn't matter. It doesn't, listen, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if the 144,000 are a separate group from this great multitude, and this great multitude is a different group, and it doesn't matter if the 144,000 and the great multitude are one in the same group, it doesn't matter. You know what matters? You really wanna know what matters? It matters whether or not we are a part of them. Am I telling the truth? Who wants to be a part of that group? I want to be a part of that. I, just, I don't care if the number is literal. Some they and listen, and the war rages, and it's really about pride, because theologians they study, and it's not just theologians. This it, it's in the present truth world too. People want to be right. They want their position to be right, and so and it's a pride thing. And if you don't see it the way I see it, I have to preach a whole sermon to correct you. You know, and, and, and we have all these rebuttal sermons going back and forth. I, I'm not interested in any of that. The only thing I'm interested in is us being a part of the group, whether it's separate groups or whether they're one in the same group. I want my name in that group. How about you? Amen. I really want our names to be in 
the group or groups, whichever you prefer, I don't care. And then it says in verse, not, uh, verse 10, it says, and cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and, upon, uh, and unto the Lamb. Now, I understand why people uh, say, oh, I understand why some take the position that, oh, this number is a literal number and it's only 144,000. And I'm gonna show you some scripture and I'm gonna show you some quotes from the spirit of prophecy that many people use to justify that type thinking. Not saying I agree or disagree, I'm just showing you what's out there. Are you with me? All right, so let's go to the screen. So here is Matthew chapter seven, verses 13 and 14 where Christ says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and a few there be that find it. So they say, oh, it's just gonna be just, it's just a few, it's just a few. And then all of these spirit of prophecy quotes that people use, and I call them the, the not, not one in dot, dot, dot quotes. You know, when she says not one in 100 or not one in 20, and, you know, so people use those quotes to say, oh, this number is limited. So let's look at some of them. Uh, again, not saying, telling you which way to go. I'm just telling you to make sure you have the character that's needed to be a part of the group, all right? So this is <clears throat> one of the quotes. It says, it is a solemn statement that I make to the church that not one in 20 whose names are registered upon the church books are prepared to close their earthly history and would be as verily without God and without hope in the world as the common sinner. They are professedly serving God, but they are more earnestly serving mammon. This half and half work is a constant denying of Christ rather than confessing of Christ. So this is one. So it's the one of, not one in quotes, not one in 20. All right, let's look at another one. Here's another one. First uh, testimony, 510. There is not one young person in 20 who has experienced in his life that separation from the world which the Lord requires of all who would become members of his family, children of the heavenly king. Uh, here's another one, first selected messages, 359, uh, paragraph two. We need also much more knowledge. We need to be enlightened in regard to the plan of salvation. There is not one in a hundred who understands for himself uh, the Bible truth on this subject that is so necessary to our present and eternal welfare. And then lastly, uh, 21MR, 295, those who will honor the Lord and keeping his Sabbath holy will be blessed of the Lord. There is not one, uh, there is not more than one in a hundred who do honor to God in keeping his Sabbath from polluting it. The word of God is not practiced by thousands who profess to be Christians. The looseness of the habits and practices of observing the Sabbath has become a customary thing. God help us to see that great blessings are enfolded, in, enfolded in the observance of the Sabbath, of the fourth commandment. The human agent cannot afford to lose these blessings by dishonoring God and their loose habits and practices. This is a day of meditation and of closely examining our own spiritual condition before God. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. So quotes like this, and it's one of the reasons why some say, oh, this number is a literal number, and it's exactly 144,000. You know, and again, I understand why they say that. But then I can see arguments on the other side, and I can see clearly why it, it may not be a literal number. And once again, not telling you which way to go, I'm telling you, it really doesn't matter. What if you know exactly the number, but you don't have the character to match? You just have knowledge, 
but a, not a saving knowledge. Am I telling the truth? Amen. So what's more important, to have their character or to know whether or not the number is actual, factual, this, that, or the other? It really doesn't matter. God wants us to have his character. Are you with me this morning? Amen. Let's go back to the verse. The verses here say in verse 11, and all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto God forever and ever, amen. And the one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And it's very interesting the way the question is asked. When you say, like, if somebody walks in and you didn't know who they were and you leaned over and you asked somebody who that was, you wouldn't say, what is, what is that? You wouldn't say that, would you? Or if it was a group of them, you wouldn't say, what are they, would you? You would say what? Who? Uh, who are they? Who, who is that, right? Well, this is asked in a way, and the elder said, uh, a, a, asked the question. He says, what are they? What are they? Which conveys the whole point I'm trying to make this morning. It doesn't matter who's going to make up that number. It doesn't even matter about the number itself. It does matter of what they are as far as character is concerned. Are you with me? Do you understand the point? What they are is more important than what comprises them. Are you with me? And so it goes on to say, um, and one of the elders answered saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. That, that's a nice way in the Bible when when, 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 the, when the person didn't know the answer, they say, you know. You remember when the Lord asked Ezekiel in Ezekiel 37? He said, son of man, in the valley of dry bones, son of man, can these bones live? And you know what he said? He said, Lord, thou knowest. <laughs> thou know. even, even the prophet John didn't know. Ezekiel, there were some things he didn't know. He was a prophet. And the Lord would say, oh, can these dry bones live? Lord, thou knowest. And then that question is being asked of John here, what are these that are arrayed in white robes? And, and whence came they? Where did they come from? And he said, hey, thou knowest. Thou knowest. He said unto him, thou knowest. And he said unto me, these are they which came out of what? Great tribulation. And what did they do? Now, what's special about them? They did what? They washed their robes and made them what? White in the blood of them. Now, listen. This is the only way you can get in. Your robes have to be washed and made white, and the only way to get them white is through one person, who? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, that's the only way. These came out of great tribulation, and they have washed their robes, and they have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, I'm not gonna spend any more time trying to decipher, you know, is it literal? Is it not literal? Mm -hmm. Are these literal Jews? Are they, you know, listen, what's important is this, is the character that makes up that group. And the only way that they can get in is they have to have white robes. The white robes represents the righteousness of Christ. Are you with me? Do you remember the parable that Christ gave about the wedding feast? And people were bidden to come and garments were furnished them, and there was a man who came in the wedding feast wearing his own garment. You remember that? Yeah. And then when the examination came, and the king came through, and he saw this man wearing his own garment, he didn't wear what was supplied to him at the king's expense. He came in saying, oh, I, 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 I'm good. I know the king has some of the top line, you know, tuxedos, but I like my own clothes. Now, we're not talking about clothes here. 
What we're talking about is righteousness. The righteousness of the king versus your own righteousness. That's really what the parable is about. And he decided he can wear his own. And when the king saw him, he said, friend, how came you in here and not have on a wedding garment? And the Bible says, and he was speechless. And then the king says, bind him hand and foot and cast him out. Is there a sermon in there somewhere? And so it's very important that we have the robe of Christ righteousness. This is all important. This is all encompassing. And so let's go back to the screen here. And notice here. Now, first selected messages, we read this last week, but it bears repeating. It is not his will that they should get into what? Controversy over questions which will not help them spiritually, such as who is to compose the 144,000. This, those who are of the, uh, of the elect of God will in a short time know without question. And then shall we not rather strive to be among that number of whom John writes, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus? Now this is so important. You know, we want to strive to be a part of that group and they have some characteristics about them they keep the commandments of God, and they have the faith of Jesus. If you keep the commandments of God, and you have the faith of Jesus, that means you have the righteousness of Christ. Are you with me? And you're obedient to the commandments of God. Now, can you slide in by breaking God's commandments? No, you cannot. Can you slide in on your own merit? No. You have to have both. You have to have the merits and righteousness of Christ. And through that and him dwelling in you, you have to obey the commandments. Now, we're going to talk about this this morning because this is important. Now, here's what I, a, a little slide I didn't have last week, but I want to share it with you this week. You know, for those who are literalists, and, 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 and we know that these 12 tribes can be found in Genesis 49, Ezekiel 48, and Revelation 7. Well, here's what you need to know about this. Each list is different, <laughs> right? There are some people that were on the list originally that weren't on the list here, and then it changed again by the time you got to Revelation 7, okay? So here in Ezekiel 48, you know, uh, you have um, Ephraim on the list. You don't find Ephraim over here. Okay, and, and then you also have Manasseh on the list. You don't find Manasseh here original in Genesis 49. Okay, by the time you get to Revelation 7, uh, Dan is missing. Dan is no longer on the list. Are you with me? And then who else is missing? Ephraim was on the list here. He's not on the list here. Are you with me? And so... Who took their place? Over here, you have Joseph on the list. But over here, Joseph is not on the list. By the time you get to Revelation, Joseph is back on the list. <laughs> Are you with me? So, so it's very, very interesting. Here, no Levi. Over here, you have Levi. By the time you get to Revelation 7, you have Levi again. And so what does that mean? So what we need to understand is God judges us based on our character and based on what we do. Are you with me? And so when you look at the life of Reuben, you know, and I don't have time to go through these, but it's very, very interesting. When you see the, the prophecy that his father gave over Reuben, you know what he said about Reuben? Who remembers what Reuben did? He did an egregious thing. You know Reuben slept with one of his father's wives. And when it came time for, 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 for Jacob to prophesy over his boys just before he went to his rest, he said, Reuben, my eldest son, he said he's as unstable as water. And when you read it in the original, you know what it says? He's as unstable as boiling water. 
That's pretty unstable, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, and look, and then he said, he will not excel. That's pretty bad, isn't it? Yeah. Now, we studied this morning in Sabbath school what Noah said about his boys, right? And now it doesn't mean that God locks that person into it because if that person repents, will God receive their repentance? Absolutely he will. Well, guess what? Reuben got it right. Reuben repented. The Bible says that Reuben shall live and not die because, and then it tells you why, because he had deep searching of heart and he repented of his ways. And of course, as goes the father, so goes the posterity. And so we can pass things on to our children that we may think, oh, well, that was just me and it ain't gonna affect them. No, not, not necessarily. You know, cause you know what they say, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Am I telling the truth? And so, so Reuben got it right. <clears throat> well, what about Simeon and, and Levi? You remember they got so mad because their, their sister got defiled and they went and they told these people, say, hey, we want you to come join the household of Israel, but you got to get circumcised, right? And once they were circumcised and they couldn't run, you know what they did? They went through and they slaughtered them with, with most viciousness. And it brought sadness to their father. But guess what? They got it right. They got it right. But there's some on this list that didn't get it right. The prophecy concerning Dan, you know what it was said about Dan? They said, Dan is a serpent, by the way. You can go read all this in Genesis 49. The prophecy concerning Dan, he says, he's a, he's a serpent, by the way, who waits for the horse to ride by and bite the horse's heels so that the rider can fall backwards. Dan had a problem with backbiting gossiping, always trying to hurt his brother, always trying to demise and undermine and tear down. But you know what? Dan was on this list. Dan made it on the list in Ezekiel 48. But guess what? Didn't make it. He didn't make the final cut because he didn't overcome. See, the list of the 12 tribes are overcomers. And the 12 tribes <clears throat> are going to be on the 12 gates. Am I right? And all of us are going to pass through one of those gates. But, but Revelation says Dan's name won't be on one of those gates because he never conquered this disease of backbody and gossiping and evil surmising. Are you with me? And that's a terrible sin. Now, somebody might say, oh, fornication. Fornicators are some of the worst people in the world. Oh, the drunkard is the worst person in the world. But this sin of backbiting and evil surmising, it's, it doesn't make a, 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 a terrible outward display, an embarrassing outward display. You know why? Because you can do it right up here, and nobody knows that you're doing it. Am I telling the truth? You can, you can give a look to somebody and make somebody think something about somebody else and never even open your mouth. Am I telling the truth? You can go behind and you can try to tear somebody down and destroy their name and their character and all the while you think you're doing God's service. You know the people that destroyed those uh, uh, that were followers of Christ, Jesus said they will drag you from place to place and they will think they're doing God's service. That's what makes it so dangerous. That's what makes it so dangerous. That's what makes it so hard to overcome because it's a heart thing. It's not an embarrassing outward display. You can be sneaky with it. And there are some that are very, very good at it. They're like Dan, that serpent, by the way, who's just waiting for the horse. The horse doesn't even see him. He's waiting for the horse to go by so he can. And then the horse rides up and calls the rider to fall backwards. And they derive pleasure to see somebody else stumble and fall. And then they can appear holy. They can preach sermons. They can preach the gospel. And they can be actually quite gifted at it. <laughs> but yet they don't know that this is a character flaw that God can never put them in a white robe in. Am I making sense today? So Dan didn't make the cut. Dan didn't make the cut. Very, very interesting. And what about Ephraim? Ephraim didn't make the final cut. You know what the Bible says about Ephraim? In the book of Hosea, the Bible says 
Ephraim is joined unto his idols. And then it says this, let him alone. Let him alone. Do you know Jesus used that phrase before? Jesus told his disciples, he says, beware of the leaven of those church leaders. Beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. And he says, they be blind guides, the blind leading the blind. And then Jesus says, let them alone. Let them alone. It's a bad thing when the command comes from God and he tells you to let them alone. Or he tells his angels, let them alone. Don't even, tells the Holy Spirit, let him alone. He's joined into his idols. It's very scary, brothers and sisters, because you will go on thinking that you're okay and not even know the Holy Spirit had left. You'll be just like uh, uh, Samson when the Bible says he wist not that the Spirit had left him. Oh, I'll get up as I always have done and I'll shake myself off. And he knew not that the Spirit had already left him. This is dangerous. So, it's about character, brothers and sisters. Now, let's go back. And it says here in verse 14, and I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them and they shall hunger no more neither thirst anymore, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This is so important, brothers and sisters. This is so powerful. God is going to wipe away. Listen, they're going to go through some hardship. They come, they're coming out of great tribulation, the Bible says. And they're going to go through some hardships, <clears throat> hunger, the sun lighting on them. Is this talking about the seven last plagues? Many believe that it is. Those who go through this crisis are going to go through the worst time in Earth's history, including through the seven last plagues. Now, there's a popular teaching in Christendom saying, oh, the church won't have to go through that. They're going to be raptured out. Is that Bible? Absolutely not. When the plagues fell on Egypt, were the children of Israel still in Egypt? Or did God take them out? They were still there. So God was with them through the plagues, and it did not come nigh their dwelling. You know, well, the first few affected everybody, but then the last plagues, didn't affect, it only affected the Egyptians. Are you with me? So God was with them through the plagues. God will be with this special group through the plagues. God will be with them. The sun. One of the plagues is the sun scorching men's body with heat. And then there's this thirsting. Because remember, the waters and the fountains and the rivers turn to what? Turn to blood. And guess what? God promises this group, your bread and your water shall be what? Shall be sure. Did God make the bread and water sure for the children of Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness? He did it for 40 consecutive years. And can God do it again? Absolutely he can, and he will, and he's going to. And so this group will suffer privation. They will suffer hardship. They will go through tribulation. And so we're going to deal with this this morning. Let's look at it. Let's go to the screen once again. This is 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. The Bible says, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall what? Shall suffer what? Persecution. That's Bible. <clears throat> Acts 14, 22 says, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. And then he says this, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Through much tribulation. So those who enter into the kingdom of God will go through some tribulation. Are you with me? It's very interesting. Now listen, go with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Now, I have said in my heart I was going to make this message short, short because last Sabbath I went for an hour and 15 minutes. Now, nobody complained, but I could see your eyes starting to get glassy. <laughs> I could see your blood sugar starting to drop. Now, we have lunch today, so if anybody passes out, we're going to run and get you a banana or something. All right? 
All right, so don't, but stick with me, but I am gonna try to keep this short because I don't like to go long every Sabbath. I, I want us to all be together. Are we in Hebrews chapter eight? Hebrews chapter eight. I wanna spend the rest of this message talking about the type of character that's needed, that's needed in order to be a part of this group, whether you believe that these groups are separate or whether you believe they're one and the same. Whether you believe that the group is literally 144,000 only, or whether you believe that the great multitude also constitutes and that the number is just symbolic. Are you with me? Hebrews chapter eight, we're gonna begin reading at verse eight. We wanna look at what we need to have in order to be in that group. Hebrews chapter eight, starting with verse eight. The Bible says, for finding fault with them, he saith, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now remember on last Sabbath, we went through all these covenants, didn't we? We went through the Abrahamic covenant, we went through the Mosaic covenant, we went through the Davidic covenant, we went through the covenant that was being reiterated to Solomon. But the Lord saying here in the New Testament, in the Christian church, I'm gonna make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and the house of Israel we discovered on last Sabbath is the church. Are you with me? And so the Lord says, I'm gonna make a new covenant with the house of, uh, of the land, house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse nine, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Because remember, the covenant of them being God's chosen people were taken away when they crucified Jesus, right? And then when they stoned Stephen, the gospel went to the Gentiles. Are you with me? Notice what it says in verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws where? In their mind and write them where? In their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. This is the new covenant that God desires to make with the Christian church today. A covenant is a contract between two or more individuals. It's an agreement. And if anyone breaks their part or breaches their part of the covenant, then the other is not obligated to do their part. Are you with me? Now, we know all about the, the, the contracts and the covenants of today. But we also studied this very intently on last Sabbath, and we looked at all these different covenants. Now, it's very, very interesting. Now, I'm sure that you are aware that the Bible makes it clear that God's law is not naturally in our heart. It's not. You know, the Bible makes it clear that we have hard hearts, and God has to take out that heart of stone, and he has to replace it with a heart of flesh. And the Lord says, and I will write my laws on the tables of that new heart. Just like God wrote on tables of stone with Moses, you remember that? And he wrote his law with his own finger in tables of stone. The Lord is saying, I'm gonna impress my law on your new heart. This is how we get that robe that we're talking about, that white robe, this is how, this is how we get in. This is how we get to be a part of this club, this exclusive club. Are you with me? Turn with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight. And we're gonna go begin reading at verse seven. Romans chapter eight, maybe Romans chapter eight, maybe verse six. Let me see here. Romans chapter eight. And yeah, we'll begin at verse six. Listen to the book. The Bible says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to what? To the law of God, neither indeed can be. So the Bible makes it clear that we are not naturally born with God's law in our heart. The Bible says as soon as we're born, we walk away speaking lies. And the commandment says, thou shalt not bear false witness. <laughs> so we, as soon as we're born, we, we're, we're very selfish as soon as we're born. But when we're born again, things change. Are you, are you with me? 
And so no one is born with God's law in the heart, not since Adam did what he did. Sin has reigned. All are born in sin. All have a carnal, evil nature. And it's clear from the word of God that the carnal mind cannot be pleasing to God. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For neither can it be subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Cannot please God. And so the carnal mind is enmity. Is enmity. And look, and that's where we find ourselves, brothers and sisters, in this world without Christ. That is where we find ourselves when we don't have the spirit of Christ. Therefore, we can never please God while we're operating in the flesh. We'll always remain at enmity with God. God will always be on one side and we'll always be on the other side because of that terrible carnal nature that we have. But don't give up. Don't lose hope, brothers and sisters. God has made a way out for each and every one of us. Are you with me? God has a solution. He says, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. And he says, not like the one I made with them of, of your fathers. He says, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. And if you will enter into this covenant agreement with me, I will put my laws into your mind and write them in your hearts. Now, this is so powerful. Now, listen, go with me to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. <clears throat> and we'll begin reading at verse 26. Now, I want you to hear how the Lord says he's going to do it. Very, very powerful. You don't have to do it. You can't do it. And there are some who try to do it, but they live a miserable Christian experience. And we don't want that. Ezekiel 36, beginning with verse 26. When you're there, please say amen. I still hear some pages. We'll wait for you. Except somebody's saying, oh, he don't have all the scriptures on the screen this week. <laughs> I, got, I got to keep us honest. I don't want us to uh, get lazy. All right, the Bible says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you. You see that? The Lord is saying, not only am I going to write the law on your heart, but I'm going to put my spirit. If God puts his spirit in you, what is he saying? I'm going to put myself in you. Are you with me? And now let's read the next clause together. And what? Cause you to walk in my statutes. Do you see that? If you call somebody to do something, what does that mean? You're helping them to do it. You're helping them to do it. So, so it's no longer you trying to do it. The Lord says, all I need you to do is accept me, come into covenant agreement with me, make the decision, and the Lord says, I will put my spirit in you, and I will, call, I will write my law on your new heart, and I will cause you to walk. I like that. I will cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. You remember what they said when Moses first gave them this stuff? They said, all that the Lord hath said, we will do. We will do. And here's the difference. The Lord's saying, no. It's not going to be like that this time. This time, I'm going to come inside of you, and I'm going to cause you. Now, you got to want it. You know, God ain't going to take you against your will. He's not going to kick in the door. He's not going to grab you by the throat, and he's not going to make you. You have to open the heart. Are you with me? And when, you, when he comes in, he will come in gladly, freely, and he will cause you. And listen, it'll be a wonderful thing. It'll be a wonderful thing. God says, if you enter this covenant with me, this is what I'll do. Now, the question most people have is, how can I know whether or not God has done this for me? How can I really have any assurance and know whether or not I have this covenant with God? Because after all, this is the most important thing, is it not? It's not knowing whether or not the number is literal or not. 
It's not even knowing who will compose that number. It's whether or not you have the same character as those who are going to be walking through with white robes on. And we all said earlier, we want that white robe, don't we? But then how can you know? How can you have the assurance whether or not you have it? That's the question. That's a good question, isn't it? How can I know and have the assurance whether or not I have this covenant with God and that he has come in and written his commandments on my heart? How can I be sure? Is there any way I can tell? Are there any evidences or telltale signs that will help me to see just where I stand with God? And the answer is yes. And there's two I want to show you today. There's two I want to share with you today. There are two ways you can know whether or not God has written his wonderful law on your heart. Who, who wants to know what they are? Number one, how do you feel when you have broken God's commandments? Will tell you whether or not they're there or not. How do you feel when you have broken God's law? How do you feel when you are aware of the fact that you actually done something contrary to that great and precious law of God? How do you feel? I remember I have a cousin <clears throat> who was on drugs. And I remember being at his house one day. And I remember saying, hey, man, don't you want to get cleaned up? Don't you want to go to rehab? And he said, he said, rehab? He said, rehab is for people that want to quit. And he made a joke out of it, and it was funny. He said, rehab is for people that want to quit. In other words, I said, it don't bother you? He said, no, it doesn't bother me. When you're breaking God's law, when you're, when you're violating his principles, if it does not bother you at all, that means his law is not there. Is that clear? That's pretty clear, isn't it? But on the other hand, if you are brokenhearted when you break the law of God, that means something is happening on the inside of you. That means there's something there, and you have to contend with it, and it won't let you rest when you do something outside of God's will, and you know it. It breaks your heart to break his commandments. That's how you know that is there. Am I telling the truth? Amen. You remember when Moses was up in the mount and God had wrote these tables, uh, or wrote the commandments out on the tables of stone, and he gave it to Moses, and he told Moses, he says, you need to get down there because they're already breaking the commandments. And Moses comes down, he's got these tables of stone, and he looks at them, and what are they doing? They have built a golden calf, and they're dancing around the golden calf naked, and they're doing all these ungodly things and what did Moses do he took the commandments and what did he do he broke them in their presence why because them breaking the commandments broke Moses' heart and so he out of frustration broke the commandments in their presence and you know the rest of the story Moses, it was in Moses' heart it wasn't just him carrying them down when he saw he was so pained by what he saw and so the question is, when you break God's commandments, does it break your heart? Do you feel bad or does it, it doesn't even bother you? It's like water off a duck's back and you on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. If it bothers you, that means that God is trying to impress these commandments upon you. Now some, it may not be fully there yet, it may not be fully developed, but it, God, but there's something in you that there's a struggle taking place and that means that there's something there. Amen. Amen. That's one way you can tell. That's one way you can tell. Are you like that person or my cousin or people like that that say, you know, uh, did it bother you to hurt that person? And they are, they on death row. Said no. And and then you know it really don't bother them when they say, I do it again. There's nothing there, brothers and sisters. But if that person has deep remorse and there's and they're sorrow, and now their heart is being broken. That means God is working on them. Are you with me? God is working on them. Well, what's another way? What's another way that we can tell? Another way that we can tell is this. What is your attitude towards living for God? What is your attitude towards living for God? 
Go with me to Psalms chapter 40 and verse 7 and 8. Psalms 40 and verse 7 and 8. I really am trying to stop. <laughs> Psalms 40, verse 7 and 8. Psalms 40, verse 7 and 8. What is your attitude towards living for God? This is the psalmist David writing this psalm, but it's really a prophecy. It's a messianic prophecy. And in this song, he's really speaking about Christ. All right? Psalm 40, are we there? Notice what it says in verses 7 and 8. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. Now let's read verse 8 together. I what? I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is where? Within my heart. Do you delight to do God's will? If you delight to do God's will, if when you break God's commandments and it breaks your heart, that means they're there. And if you delight to do God's will, that means they're there. But now if you don't delight doing God's will, that's a telltale sign. That's a telltale sign. If you, if, if you say, man, I got to go to church today. And it's a drudgery and you hate it. Then that means his commandments aren't there. And you can't have that white robe. You can't be those that march in before the throne of God with palm branches singing blessing and salvation be unto our God. You can't have the word. If, listen, if you don't want to be in his presence now and you hate going to church, you're not going to be in that crowd that's going to be around that throne 24-7 singing praises and glory. And listen, I'm just keeping it 100 as the young people say. Am I telling the truth in here? What is your attitude towards God? Listen, if we can't stand to be in his presence, and if we don't delight to do his will, if doing his will we, we, we're bothered by it, chances are the commandments aren't there. None other but the Lord Jesus Christ himself said these words, oh, how I delight to do thy will. All right? And the Bible makes it clear. And then he gave the reason why. He says, because his law is where? In my heart. And if the law is in your heart, you delight to do the will of the Lord. Amen. When the pastor calls for doing outreach, you delight to do the will of the Lord. You want others, you want others to be blessed. You want others to receive this truth that you rejoice in. Are you with me? Amen. Now check this out. There are people who are religious. They go to church, but they don't enjoy it. And they do it out of obligation. They say, well, I've got to do what is right because I don't want to be lost. And guess what? I don't want to burn in hell, so I do it. And so out of a sense of duty, they try to keep the Ten Commandments and they try to do what is right. Their religious experience is a burden it is not enjoyable. They don't delight in it. Isn't that sad? The most miserable Christians in the church who are only there because they know the alternative is hell. But they pass by the bar. They pass by the nightclub. They pass by Bee's Barbecue. And they say, I don't do that anymore. But you know what they're saying on the inside? I sure wish I could. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? They don't delight in the Lord. Their religion is a burden. So two things. If it breaks your heart to break God's heart, his commandments are there. If you delight to do his will and and God says to do something, and you're not mouthing back at him, and you don't have a problem with it, and you know what? You rush, you hasten to do his will. You delight to do his will. If you don't, 
and I'm not judging anybody in here, I'm just trying to make you think this morning, if you wanna be a part of that 144,000 who will go through this time of trouble, this is what we need. It's a character thing. It's a character thing. It's not a knowledge thing. You can have knowledge and still not be saved. Am I telling the truth? You can have knowledge and still not be saved. Now listen, in closing, let's go back to Romans 8. I promise, I'm on, well, I don't want to promise. <laughs> let's, let's go back to Romans 8. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. Let's go back to Romans 8. Let's go back to Romans 8. Notice what it says in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the what? After the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now watch this. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Now I want you to keep in mind, we're talking about people who are keeping and trying to do right out of obligation, not because they love the Lord and not because they delight to do his will. Now watch, the, the law can't be fulfilled in them because the flesh is weak. Watch, it, watch what it says, what Paul says in verse 3. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin, where? In the flesh. That the, now watch this. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled, where? In us. So he will cause you to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments. That the righteous, through Jesus, through Jesus Christ, not through your own efforts. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the spirit do mind the things of this. Uh, uh, they, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. So the Lord says, I will put my spirit within you. I will write my commandments upon your heart. And I will cause you to keep my commandments and my statutes. Brothers and sisters, this is what we need in order to be a part of the 144,000. We need a character change. We need a new heart. And the Lord says, I'm going to give it to you. No money, no price. You just ask for it. You just open your heart. And the Lord says, I will give it to you. Now, who wants that heart this morning? Who wants? And listen, when you receive it, that comes with the white, that is the white robe. Amen. That's the righteousness. Who, what, what are they? These are those who have given their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. These are those who delight to do his will. These are those who when they break his heart, it breaks their heart. Amen. Who receives God's word this morning? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for showing us the characteristics of those who will be dressed in right, white. And Lord, we pray to be amidst that number. We don't want to get into spiritual warfare as to our doctrinal position. That's, that means nothing. But Lord, we want to be holy on your side. And we want to have your character in our forehead. The 144,000 standing on Mount Zion with Jesus Christ and their Father's name written in their foreheads, meaning they have the Father's character. Lord, we want his character this morning. We open our hearts to you. Lord, we know that we cannot keep your law in our own. And those who have tried, it is misery. And so, Father, relieve them of that misery this morning. Help them to delight to do thy will because thy law is written in the heart. Help us, Lord, that if we violate your word, if we violate your commandments, that our hearts may be broken. Father, we thank you for this free gift. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.